This program is brought to you by Emory University. It is my pleasure to welcome faculty, students, family, and friends this afternoon. I also want to extend a special welcome to President Carter and the IDN SEPA scholars. President Carter, I know that our scholars have been looking forward to talking with you about their research experiences. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Um, my name is Cynthia Addy. I did my research in Uganda, which is in East Africa, right. and the topic of my research was women in parliament and their impact on women's human rights. Very interesting. Hi, Mr. President. Um, my name is Jenny Ja, and um, I did my study abroad um, in South Africa in Cape Town. Um, and the focus of my research project was um, about maternal health um, and perspectives of um, birth in a township in Cape Town. Hi, hi, President Carter. My name is Stanton Abramson. I also studied abroad in Cape Town, South Africa. Yeah. My project focused on the effects of post apartheid post-apartheid education reforms in South Africa's township schools. Thank you. Hi, President Carter. My name is Rebecca Altman. I conducted my study abroad research in Vietnam, and the topic of my research was the cultural influences on iron fortification of fish sauce. Right. Good afternoon, President Carter. My name is Cassandra Webster, and I did my study abroad in Dakar, Senegal, in West Africa, and um, my research topic was contraception use among married women. Hi, Mr. President. My name is Chelsea Deltweiler. Um, I did my research in Nicaragua, and I was working with a government-sponsored rural development agency that would give pregnant cows and chickens and things to women. Um, and so I was studying how that economic development program was affecting the health of the women that were recipients of the, of the goods. Hello, President Carter. I'm Atlee Tyree. Um, I also studied abroad in Dakar. And I did my research on art and development in artist workshops yeah. in rural Senegal. Passive background. Hello, Mr. President. My name is Sarah Burney, and I studied abroad in Uganda. Huh. And I worked in a rural community on the Kenyan-Ugandan border, and I looked at HIV education program effectiveness for teaching about both heterosexual and same-sex sexual behaviors. Thank you. Hello, Mr. President. My name is Allison Cohen, and I did my research project in Ladakh, Mysore, and Dharamsala, India. Huh. And I primarily focused on the role of divination practices in Tibetan contemporary society, and with some emphasis on the influence of cultural identity and democratization, and how those things influenced um, shifts in divination practices since going into exile. Good afternoon, President Hi. Carter. Um, my name is Emily Cumby Drake and I also studied abroad in Uganda. And um, my research was focused on girls' health and nutrition education in a rural village in Uganda. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, President Carter. Uh, my name is Spear Hodges. Uh, I studied abroad in Managua, Nicaragua. Mm -hmm. uh, my my uh, actual research was on the relationship between foreign direct investment and what I called responsible capitalism. Uh, by using case examples of nine different companies. Good afternoon, President Carter. Yeah. My name is Sveta Malusheva. I studied abroad in Argentina, and my work was focused on the economic condition of cooperatives started by their workers during the 2001 economic crisis. Hi, President Carter. My name is Golsa Yazdi. Um, I studied abroad in Dakar, Senegal, and my research focused on legalized prostitution in Dakar, Senegal. Hello, President Carter. Hi. My name is Grace Choi, and I actually studied abroad in Ghana, West Africa. And I actually was researching how vocational schools could increase access to the international market for seamstresses. Yeah. And, and the United States basically, and the Western world basically emphasizes this one aspect of human rights. If you, if you interviewed the first 10 people you met on the street in Atlanta and asked them what, what name the human rights, they would say freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, trial by jury, and so forth, which is very good. But they, if you ask the average person in South Africa or Senegal or Ghana or Nicaragua about the basic human rights, they say a, a right to have a job, a right to have a place to live, a right to have food to eat, to raise my children, to get them an education. So the economic and social rights are just as important as are the fundamental freedoms that we uh, emphasize in this, in this country. How do you balance the need to monitor international aid 
um, but to also allow the countries and communities receiving the aid to determine how it would best improve their condition. Well, when I was uh, asked to make, I was asked to make two speeches when the millennium changed, when we went from 2000, the year 2000. One was in Asia and the other one was in Oslo, Norway. And the, my assigned topic was, what is the greatest challenge that faces the world in the new millennium? And my answer was the growing disparity between rich people and poor people. It's not only a great chasm, but the difference is getting bigger every year. And not only within countries, like within the United States, the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer, but between the rich countries on the one hand and the poor countries on the other. And the problem still, the basic problem is that the rich countries don't give adequate attention to sharing their enormous wealth with the people who are in need. Uh, the last statistics I saw, the United States government gives 16 cents out of every hundred dollars of our national income. And a lot of people in public opinion polls think that we give about 15 percent for foreign aid. We give less, much less than half of one percent. And if you add on the great foundations like the Ford Foundation and, and the Gates Foundation, that adds six more cents. So the total amount that the United States government gives for foreign aid is 22 cents out of $100. I think the United States ought to be in the forefront uh, for demanding high standards on environmental quality. Uh, we should be leading the worldwide effort to control global warming and be ready to uh, take whatever action scientific uh, analysis requires to lead the other countries. But we've been the most reluctant among the major countries to do so. Europe's been way ahead of us and others. Th there are some major countries that haven't complied. They are still developing in, uh, in definition, that, like India and China. But I think if the United States was in the forefront of saying, we'll do what we can, and set an example, I think that China and, and, and India would come along. What effect do you think the 2008 financial crisis has had on the ability of the world capitalist system to address inequities through socially responsible initiatives? And on that same note, do you see a greater combination of socialistic elements within the global capitalist framework that could end the mentality of the two being mutually exclusive? Well, this brings up a basic a political problem that I think every nation on earth has to face between so-called socialism and, and uh, free enterprise. And the different nations struggle with it and, and find different answers. And I think that will continue on in the foreseeable years of history. Um, most countries have reached a, a fairly good compromise between permitting freedom of, uh, of an entrepreneur to make a profit for himself or herself in competition with others, that is the free enterprise system, but also guarantee that those that you might say get left behind, the poor, the deprived, the afflicted, the blind, the um, ones that are outcast in society, be treated equally. And with the social security program in our country and with Medicaid, Medicare and so forth, uh, we have taken some steps toward doing that. But in, in our uh, Congress now, for instance, there's an intense debate between, I would say, Republicans on one hand and the Democrats on the other. Uh, should we expand the effort of government to meet the needs of those who are deprived and kind of equalize the process in society? Or should we have uh, survival of the fittest only? And, and I don't know exactly where to draw the line. I happen to be a Democrat, and I believe it was good uh, back in the ancient days when we established Social Security, when we had Medicaid, Medicare. And I, and I was in favor of a passage of the health care bill uh, earlier this year. But, uh, but there's a limit to how much government can do. And, and I've also been an entrepreneur myself. I've been a businessman myself and so forth. And I, I earn my own living. I make my living now by writing books. And I get a salary as a professor as well. I get retirement from my presidency. So I have an adequate income. But, uh, but I think that uh, I, I feel very strongly that uh, is some elements of a social system, if you don't just call it socialism, which some people equate with communism. But a socialist society, I think, uh, can be uh, very protective of the competitive 
uh, economic system that makes uh, innovation attractive and, and lets people invest their time and money to come up with a new idea to make a profit, which is very good. It stimulates the growth of, of the economy on the one hand, and, and the government to collect an appropriate uh, level of taxes spread among all uh, income groups and, and give some of that money to people who obviously are left behind or need to have recompense. My family was the first one that had a grandmother and a great grandson <laughs> both in the Peace Corps. So I believe that uh, the kind of work that you've done can be an example for others and for you for the rest of your life. I'm very proud of you and grateful to you. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.